Hi everybody, welcome to the talk. Uh, my name is Mark Webster. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, verifiable software architectures for autonomous robotic systems. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to say thanks to um, the organizers, uh, Charles, Michael, Alcino, uh, for organizing the workshop, making it all happen. So a little bit about a little bit about me. <laughs> So I'm Matt Webster, I'm a senior lecturer in computer science at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. Uh, so my research interests include autonomous systems, uh, verification, validation and robotics. Um, obviously I don't do this work just by myself, lots of other people uh, are instrumental in this. Um, the work was supported by Orca Hub Liverpool University, uh, Harry Watt University, Royal IHC who are one of our industrial partners and EPSRC. So just a quick overview of the talk. Um, so we're going to cover autonomous systems and what we mean by autonomy, uh, verification and validation uh, methods, and self-certification as well. So this is related to the topic of certification where you uh, certify that a particular robotic system, for example, is, is safe to use in a particular environment or, under, or within certain parameters, um, but self-certification moves that forward to let the autonomous system um, basically contribute to the certification effort itself. Uh, so what that means is the auto, the autonomous system can essentially say, I'm fit to continue working or to start working in this particular uh, domain at this particular time. So what do we mean by autonomous systems in general? Well. Um, Autonomy basically is the ability of a system to make its own decisions without direct human intervention. Uh, so within practical applications, there are many different levels of autonomy. Uh, so these, one of these uh, taxonomies is called the PACT um, taxonomy. So this is pilot authorization and control. Um, and it basically, re this one relates to uh, autonomous systems for use in aviation. Um, although there are other ones that uh, pertain to other domains. Um, and this one is quite a useful way of thinking about it. So if you look at the uh, table on the right, uh, you can see that the pack levels go from five down to zero. Um, so five being full autonomy, uh, zero being no autonomy. So you're doing basically direct control by the human operator. Then you've got these different levels within, uh, within that range. Um, starting from giving advice. Uh, so this is the autonomous system giving advice to the human. Uh, advice uh, all the time, so not even if it's requested, is at level two. Uh, level three is advice and if authorized action. And level four is action unless uh, revoked. So that means the autonomous system will, will do something unless it's been told not to by the human operator. Okay, so what do we mean again by sort of teleoperation and autonomy? So early robotic systems um, often teleoperated. So you know, early early robotic systems, uh, factory machines either teleoperated or working on a, a very sort of strict program. Um, of, obviously, if you're using uh, teleoperation, you've got problems. What if the communications link goes down? What if there are delays or interference, or what if there's a malicious uh, user who's trying to jam that that radio link? Um, obviously, a, a remote a remote operator can also lack full situational awareness as well. So, if you're controlling the UAV and it's close to you, like uh, in the image here, um, you've got pretty good situational awareness. But if this UAV is is two miles away, uh, in the middle of a storm, you can't even see it then you might have very poor situational awareness and therefore um, it's much more difficult to control safely. Obviously autonomy can help with uh, solving these problems. So clearly autonomy is a desirable feature for many uh, robotic systems. Um, the limitations of teleoperation disappear uh, and, and autonomous systems can actually be faster and more reliable than, than human beings. Um, Machines are often uh, better at doing a job um, than people are. 
in many different ways. Um, to begin with, maybe the machine's not as good, but after time, and uh, after after we've we've had time to uh, develop the technology, then it gets better and it gets more reliable than people. So that's the advantage of autonomy. However, autonomy presents new problems. Uh, so autonomous systems themselves are sophisticated. Uh, and they're at the forefront of computer science research. So things like agent-based systems, multi-agent systems, machine learning systems, and then the the other technologies that go with them, like our advanced sensor and control systems. Um, so all of these advanced systems means that verification of autonomous systems is very difficult uh, in general. Obviously, if you've got a simple control system or a simple autonomous system, then verification can be fairly easy. If you've got something like the, um, the full self-driving technology that's used by Tesla that you can see in the video on the right, uh, that can be quite hard to, to verify fully and make sure that it's doing exactly what you want it to. So th the key thing is there's no silver bullet for verification. So different verification methods work at different levels of abstraction and also for different kinds of systems. So uh, we might come up with a, uh, a spectrum, if you like, of, of different verification methods. So, uh, for example, you ha might have formal methods at one end, going through simulation and experiments. So at the, at the left-hand side of this spectrum, you've got very sort of abstract models of the, the system that you're looking at. So in, in formal methods, for example, we might have a, uh, an abstract uh, state diagram like the one here. Um, where you've got a finite number of states and, and, and actions uh, between those states. Um, within simulation, you've got a lot more states. Uh, so you're looking at, uh, for example, 3D models or real-time models of, of, of an oil rig in this case. So this was some research that was done at the University of Liverpool. Um, and then you can model using things like computational fluid dynamics. You can model the, the airflow around the legs of this uh, oil rig. And of course, experiments. So you do real-world experiments, and this is even more detailed. You've got even more states, um, but it's it's hard to do uh, uh, real-life, real-world experiments because you can't speed time up, for example, like you can in the simulation. Um, also, you can only run as many experiments as you've got space for, physical space for. Whereas on a on a computer simulation, you can buy lots more computers and, and use lots more processing uh, cores and do lots of more uh, simulation uh, in parallel. So this is just an example of the kind of uh, simulations that are being used um, today. So this is some of our colleagues, some of our colleagues at the uh, Royal IHC. Uh, so they developed a um, simulation of an autonomous uh, ship uh, which is which is doing a inspection task for offshore renewable energy. So you've got these wind turbines, you've got a ship, and you've got an autonomous system which is controlling the ship. And one of the ways that they did verification of this autonomous system is by using this uh, uh, high fidelity simulation environment. So you've got a simulation environment which models accurately the uh, the waves, wind speed, you've got the wind turbines themselves, you've got the sensors on board the, the ship, you've got the autonomous system which is taking information from those sensors and providing it to actuate, actuators. Um, and all of that is a, essentially a virtual prototype of that ship um, and how it works within within simulation. So simulation is, is, is advanced. Um, it's, uh, it's, get, it's getting very close to uh, the kind of fidelity we can get with with real systems in, in real experiments. So um, the, one of the key questions is about verifiable software architectures is, um, you know, how can we uh, come up with ways to verify uh, those systems? So this is an architecture for, for verifying software and it, it uses the three different verification methods that we've spoken about already. So uh, experiments, um, simulation-based testing and formal verification. So this is the formal method that we, we mentioned earlier. Uh, so you can combine these these um, verification methods uh, 
within a single approach which we call corroborative verification where each verification method produces evidence which is uh, then um, compared with the evidence from the other uh, approaches and using the approaches together um, within this approach within this framework can give you uh, a greater level of assurance that the uh, autonomous system is doing exactly what you think it's doing. Basically you gather data from experiments for example and you might work out that a particular autonomous system is reliable 80% uh, of the time for example uh, and then you might do some simulation and find out that it's 85% within the simulation so you know there's something that's different between these two methods and what's going to be different is either the way that you've specified the requirement or the way that you've you've modeled the system so you go into these models and you can update the uh, the way you've modeled it or check the way you've modeled it um, likewise you can go into the requirements uh, definitions and make sure that you've modeled the requirements in the right way and um, by going around this diagram then you get to a point where you uh, hopefully match up corroborate the evidence produced by simulation-based testing and by experiments um, and therefore have the experiments and the simulation-based testing back each other up and then you, you carry on into formal verification doing the same thing again so the whole thing goes around again uh, so there's a paper that we, we wrote where we describe um, that happening so the, paper, the link is there at the bottom uh, in the International Journal of Robotics Research Okay, so I also said that I was going to talk about uh, self-certifying autonomous systems. So certification is, is something that we do when we want to confirm certain characteristics of, of an object or a person or an organization. So something that's uh, present in a lot of people's minds at the moment is, is vaccine certification or vaccination certification. How do you make sure uh, you certify that somebody has, has had a vaccine? Um, so... But you can do it with other things, obviously, things like um, driving licenses or a pilot's licenses, or you, you can certify an object, you can certify a robot for use um, at the North Pole, for example, or within, within a certain range of, of temperatures or within a certain environment. Um, so software itself has to be certified too. So software certification is performed by certificators. Um, but with autonomous systems, it's possible that we could offload some of the certification workload um, to the autonomous system itself. And so what we're talking about is ongoing self-analysis by the autonomous system during its operation. So the autonomous system is continually monitoring itself, making sure that it's it's safe to, to carry on uh, doing what it's doing. So what we're coming into here is the next sort of verifiable software architecture. And this is an architecture for the autonomous system itself uh, and how it would work uh, with um, with these extended rational agents or these extended systems of rational agents. So what do we mean by rational agent? Well um, a common approach to encapsulate autonomy is to use this BDI model of autonomy. So BDI stands for beliefs, desires and intentions. So what we're talking about here is agents. So agents that are based on beliefs, desires, and intentions can communicate their behavior to human operators in an intuitive way. So people think about their own behaviors in terms of um, their beliefs, their desires, intentions. You say, well, why did you do what you did? Well, I believed that this was the case and I wanted this to happen. And so I, I intended to do this. So likewise, if you build a machine or you build an algorithm that uses beliefs, desires, and intentions, then that's quite simple to explain to people why the machine is doing what, what it's doing at a particular point in time. Also, you can interrogate the machines to analyze root causes of a particular action, for example. So again, it's, it's intuitive. You can ask the machine, well, why did you believe that? You, know, you might say, well, um, I had the sensor reading and the sensor told me that, that the temperature was 25 degrees, so I, I had that belief. Um, or you might say, well, why did you desire to turn right? And the machine could tell you, well, I was following the, the rules of the road. For example, if it was a, an autonomous system for a driverless car. Uh, and you can also, using BDI, you can, you can verify um, the 
the autonomous behaviors with respect to requirements using formal methods. So BDI, because it's based on um, logics of belief, desires, and intentions, um, it lends itself well to, to uh, formal methods and model checking um, for verification. So um, why self-certifying autonomous systems then? Well, a general problem is that certification approaches often assume that there's a, a finite set of hazards or failures that, that the system uh, will encounter and that these can be identified beforehand that it won't change over the lifetime of the system and so you can use a mitigation based approach so for example um, this happens within the aviation industry when you do certification of an aircraft um, you identify all of the particular hazards that can happen or the failures that can happen of, of particular systems you go through a, a big long list of of these hazards uh, and failures and you you design the system to be able to compensate for those. However, with autonomous systems, those assumptions might not be true. So autonomous systems can operate for long periods of time, potentially months or years. Uh, they can move into uh, operational environments that are different from the ones that you originally designed them for, for example. So people might take a robot and then uh, use it in a, in a different country from the ro from the country it was originally uh, designed for use in. Uh, so the legal requirements may have changed, uh, for example. So you might want the robot to be able to identify uh, its changing environment and therefore be able to um, self-certify itself as safe for use in the, in the new environment. Okay, so self-certification might seem like a, a strange idea for autonomous systems. And um, that's possibly because certification we often think of as something that is done by a person or, or organization to some object. So, for example, you might have a certificator who, who says, um, I certify that this particular aircraft is safe to you. So based on the, the certification evidence, uh, the regulator like the C Civil Aviation Authority in the UK or the FAA in the US might say, um, yeah, based on the evidence that you show me, I'm happy to certify that this aircraft can be used. Um, however, self-certification is already something that we, we see with people. So, for example, for drivers have to be licensed to drive a car. But whenever a driver gets in a car, they effectively self-certify that they're still fit to drive. So, for example, when you get in the car, you make sure that you're, you're not drunk. You make sure that if you wear glasses, that you, you've got your glasses on. You make sure that you know you, you're not injured. Uh, therefore, you, you're safe to drive. You've self-certified yourself to, uh, as as a, a driver. Uh, another example of self-certification of people is um, illness. So, if you take time off work, typically you don't need a doctor's note at first. Um, you can self-certify that you're ill uh, or that you were ill at a particular time. And uh, so, these are ways that people self-certify themselves, and that's because people are autonomous. Uh, so we want to extend this idea into autonomous systems and let autonomous systems uh, be aware of themselves, um, be aware of their current state and their current environment, and therefore uh, be able to verify themselves as fit to use uh, and safe to use uh, within their environment. So the way we might do this is to expand our, our definition of uh, rational agents. So the agent that we had before will contain a number of different models that enable the agent to be self-aware of, uh, of, of the robot it's, imbe it's, it's embodied within. So within the autonomous system we could have an interaction model that models how the, um, how the agent or how the autonomous system is, is supposed to interact with people. You can have a safety model, which models the actual safety requirements of, you know, how, how uh, reliable do I need to be, uh, for example. Um, so if, if, say, a sensor breaks, does the my new configuration minus that sensor, uh, does that still allow me to operate within uh, safe parameters? So the self model, again, this comes into like a knowledge, if you like, of, of, of the, the anatomy of the, of the robotic system. So what what am I composed of? I've got, you know, um, two camera sensors and I have, uh, you know, four wheels, 
uh, have a, a radar dish and whatever whatever it is. Um, this is your model of self, and therefore, by knowing yourself as the autonomous system, uh, as the autonomous system can reason about itself, um, it's able to uh, basically verify uh, continually online that it's it's safe to continue to be used. Finally, a task model. So the autonomous system understands what's expected of it. So like the driver of a, of a car, you know when you drive what's expected of you, um, either from, you know, your passengers expect you to be able to get to the destination, um, they'll, you know, and park up somewhere safely, but also the law expects you to adhere to space, uh, adhere to speed limits. Um, for example, so you you know what the, the task is. So these are all things that we could build into uh, an autonomous system as well to give it awareness of the of itself and and also the context in which it's operating. So how would we go about um, uh, doing uh, verification of those different models within uh, the autonomous system? Well, if you've got an interaction model, then you can do um, studies with human robot interaction to make sure that the the autonomous system is uh, interacting effectively with with uh, the person or the team that it's a part of and this also relates to remote control and situational awareness as well because those are things that are, imp are particularly important when uh, interfacing with with humans so the safety model again so runtime safety monitors you could use those to ensure that safety um, requirements are being met uh, continually through the operation of the robotic system. Uh, the self model, again, you can have ontologies which um, let you define the architecture of the autonomous system um, in a logical way that, the, that, that are basically machine readable, that the machine can understand and, and, and understand its, uh, its, own, its own makeup. Uh, finally, the task model, so things like the, the tasks being written down <clears throat> in ontological uh, framework risk analysis, scheduling, all that kind of stuff. So concepts of space and time and different limitations. So all these things come together and we can do verification of the um, the autonomous system based on this division of the the autonomous system into different uh, models regarding the, the, the system itself and the task. So one benefit of um, Rational agents is that we can use formal verification to analyze them. So we can use something called model checking. We can also use automated theorem proving. Of course, these approaches can have a problem called the state space explosion problem. So as the systems become more complex, it takes more time and memory to verify them. Uh, obviously, by introducing new subcomponents, we've made the systems even more complex. So how do we, we verify them in that case? So the answer in that case will be to use verifiable HRI uh, for the interaction model, uh, verifiable safeguards uh, for the runtime monitors, uh, verifiable and reconfigurable architectures, and verifiable planning and activity. So you can see that we're creating the autonomous system with the intention that it can be verified. So we design it for verification rather than designing an autonomous system and then saying, okay, so how do we verify it now? Um, this way around, we, we we design the the system, the autonomous system, from the ground up, so that it, the verification and verifiability is a part of of the system. And again, this comes back to corroborative verification and validation, because I mentioned on the previous slide that you want to integrate this system as a whole and verify it as a whole. And again, this is something that you can do using corroborative uh, VNV, so you can analyze the system uh, using different models. Uh, formal models, simulations, uh, and experiments, and so so on and so forth, and and reach uh, a level of agreement between these different verification and validation methods. So just a, a quick example. So this uses a bit of notation from uh, formal methods. So um, don't worry if this doesn't make a great deal of sense. There's more information uh, in, in the paper uh, that I can uh, send to you. Um, on self-certification, uh, which describes this in more detail. So what this basically means is we might have an unmanned aircraft like this UAV here. We've got an interaction model and it requires that it's always the case that we eventually within one second, we send the flight status to the user. So that what that means is that we're always gonna send the flight status 
every second to the user. Now in the self model uh, contains a description of the system which says that if the antenna is working then send uh, some value uh, to the user. Now we suppose that the, um, the unmanned aircraft system's antenna becomes damaged so the rational agent updates its belief base with the belief that the antenna is no longer working. So then the runtime monitor and the safety model determines that it can't send X to the user anymore, it can't send that message anymore that it was going to because now it believes that the, the antenna is broken then it, it believes that this is no longer working and therefore this is no longer true. This violates the requirement above and so this, this requirement here and notifies the UAS operator that the unmanned aircraft can't achieve it cannot achieve its task as described within the uh, task model. So this is how you could sort of bring these things together using formal methods. So just to uh, summarize, uh, we've covered verifiable software architectures for autonomous robotic systems. Autonomous systems, of course, are very useful, but can be difficult to verify. Uh, but we could use novel software architectures and approaches in order to make that verification easier. So those sorts of things might be self-certification or the corroborative V and V uh, that we've looked at a couple of times in this talk. And that's it. Thank you.